Good morning. One of the pieces of advice that you hear a lot when you're doing public speaking is to open with a joke. <laughs> and another piece of advice that you hear is to engage the audience right away, to get them to respond immediately. And the only way I know to do both is with a knock-knock joke. <laughs> so knock-knock. Who's there? Larry Pass. Larry Pass is who? It's not clear how to respond to that. <laughs> But perhaps we'll get back to it. The title of this talk is Practicing Your Presence. And of course, that's keying off the, the uh, phrase to practice the presence of God, which Joel Goldsmith in his book, of course, was using. It goes back to a 17th century monk named, or who took the name Brother Lawrence. So how is practicing your presence linked to practicing God's presence. Well, let's go to Ernest Holmes. Seminar Lectures. This may be my favorite Ernest Holmes book. And it's a transcripts of a number of lectures, hence the name, that he gave at a spiritual retreat, or as he calls it, a spiritual advance, which I like. And he says, we should acquire a greater consciousness in uniting our thought with each other in a common cause and purpose for which we work, and upon which our whole practice is based, a consciousness of the presence of God within everything and everyone. And he goes on in a little prayer at the beginning here. Let us turn our attention, or invocation, I guess, uh, to the divine presence within, which is both the center and circumference of our real being. It is the infinite presence which inhabits eternity and finds a dwelling place in our own consciousness. We know we are one with it and in it, for there is no separation from it. Although he tweaks that just a little bit on the next page. He says, I believe we are not one in God or one with God, but we are one of God. And in here, he also uses a phrase that you'll see in a lot of his writings, that each of us is an individualized center in the consciousness of God. And so practicing our presence, practicing God's presence, there is definitely a link, a commonality there. So how do we practice our presence? Well, I'm thinking of a story about this 20th century Spanish painter I'm going to sit for a while. Spanish painter. Uh, I'm not that familiar with the art world, but perhaps some of you who are will recognize the name. He was called uh, Pablo Picasso. <laughs> and this, is, this took place in late 1950s, early 1960s. Somewhere around there, there were uh, a rash of Picasso forgeries going around. People were just painting things that looked kind of like Picasso and selling them. And since this was, well, man was still alive, number of art dealers and brokers and collectors got together and decided to hire him to just authenticate which ones were really his and which ones weren't. So, so we find Picasso sitting in a room with a friend of his, the Keaton Company. He's just got stacks of paintings that he's going through, you know, real, real, fake, fake, real, fake, whatever. And he's got one that he's holding and he's about to toss it on the fake pile. And his friend says, no, no, Pablo, wait, that's, that's one of yours. I, I saw you paint it myself. And Picasso looks at it again, and then he says to his friend, I can fake a Picasso as well as anybody. <laughs> so what's he saying there? He's saying, yes, he painted the painting, but he wasn't, he wasn't being Picasso when he did it. He wasn't Picassoing, so to speak. He's, he wasn't present for the painting of that painting particular picture. A lot of alliteration here. And that, that leads me to ask the question, how, how often am I not painting my Picassos? How often does each of us fake our Picassos? Or rather, fake our Cheryl's, our Deirdre's, our Cappy's, and so on. Our Larry's, certainly. Larry Pass who? I have to say that I was, I was actually a bit 
anxious and hesitant about doing this particular uh, talk today, in part because most of you know I have chronic fatigue syndrome, and it's hit a little harder this summer than I had expected it to, and I just wasn't sure I had necessarily the energy and the wherewithal to prepare and, and then uh, do a talk. But in addition, talking about pres practicing your presence, I was wondering if I was really, as they say, walking this talk. But I realized that a lot of this talk is asking questions, and I'm certainly doing that. So uh, to a certain extent, a large part of this is inviting you to ask yourself some of the questions that I've been asking. Um, let's see. I had another reference to something else. It was the movie Anger Management. How many of you have seen the movie Anger Management? You remember there's a scene there early on where, where the Adam Sandler character is attending his first anger management session. And the Nicholson character, in order to get him to introduce himself to the group, says, well, tell us who you are. And so Sandler starts talking about his job. And Nicholson character says, no, 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 that's, that's what you do for a living. Tell us who you are. And so he starts again. He starts talking about, well, I like to play golf and this and that. No, no, no. Those are your hobbies. We just want to know who you are. And so then he says, well, I'm a nice guy. I help my friends. I give the chair. No, no. That's your personality. Just tell us who you are. Now, of course, in the context of the movie, what he's doing is doing is trying to get a rise out of the Sandler character because it's anger management. But if you think about it, how can you possibly really answer that question? You know, Larry Pass, who? What is it that defines who you are? Well, one, one way to approach that question is with a, another quote from Ernest Holmes. This is from this, this thing called you, which is, I guess, a, a lot of people's favorite Ernest Holmes book. Uh, I think those are people who haven't read seminar lectures. I just, I just prefer it. But this is a very good book, too. And the phrase occurs here that occurs again in a lot of his writings. But there's a particular way of phrasing it here. There is a pattern of your being, or a real spirit of you, which is as eternal as God, as indestructible as reality, and as changeless as truth. This pattern is seeking to manifest through you. And I find the phrasing of that very interesting. He doesn't say, this pattern manifests through you. He says it's seeking to manifest through you. When you're practicing your presence, when you're fully present, that's when it shows up. And I, I am thinking, I'm quoting a lot of uh, pop culture, or semi-pop culture here. In the 1970s, Harry Chapin had a song, Taxi. I don't know how many of you remember that. It's about a San Francisco taxi driver who one night uh, has a fair who's his uh, an ex-girlfriend of his from long ago and far away. Well, long ago, I guess not far away. And that's the narrative of the song, you know, how, how he picks up the, the fair and turns out to be his girlfriend and so on and so forth. But during the bridge of that song, he steps out of the narrative and he says, well, he sings, I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> I've got something inside me, but it's not what my life's about. Because I've been letting my outside tide me over till my time runs out. So he's got this, he knows he's got this pattern of perfection inside him, but it's not manifesting. It's not what his life's about. He's just letting his, letting his outside tide, he's killing time until he's out of time. And when I thought of that phrase, killing time, it reminded me of a phrase from Henry David Thoreau's Walden. Now, the phrase that we most know from Thoreau's Walden is the thing about having a different drummer drumming, which we did today. Uh, <laughs> but, but the phrase that, that I think of is, he says, as though one could kill time without injuring eternity. To just let your outside tide you over, to just kill time. 
injures that perfect pattern within you. You're not letting it do what it's seeking to do to manifest. Reverend Michael Beckwith offers a model for spiritual development. It's a model among several, but it's, it's a useful one. And it has four stages to it. And the first stage is life happens to me. It's a passive stage. You're sitting back. Things are just happening to you. Whatever's going on, I'm letting my outside tide me over. I didn't choose to be a taxi driver. This is something that happened to me. I wanted to be a, a pilot. Obviously, in this stage, it's very hard to practice your presence, to manifest that perfect pattern that is you, or that is seeking to manifest. The next stage is life happens by me. Now, this is a very active phase. This is where you're out there making things happen. Now, maybe you're doing it in a very spiritual way through the law of attraction, through the law of attraction. Or maybe you're just doing it through sheer effort of will. Think of you know, Donald Trump. Things are happening by me. I'm making it happen. Or again, think of Picasso when he painted that painting that he threw on the fake pile. That was being painted by Picasso, but it wasn't his pattern manifesting. He was not practicing his presence there. Now, I can't speak for Donald Trump. I don't know if he's practicing his presence when he's out there willing and dealing, or Napoleon or whoever, who are obviously in that life happens by me stage. So there is a possibility in that stage that you're practicing your presence, that you're present more, that your, your pattern is manifesting. It's possible that it's not can happen either way. The next stage in Michael Beckwith's model is life happens through me. Here you think of yourself as a, a conduit or a channel for the flow. You step, you step aside to allow things to happen, to let things happen. You hear that a lot with um, spiritual healers. I'm not doing the healing. I'm just the channel through which it heals. And if you think about it, that's a very, again, a very passive mode. You're not active in the world. You're at a higher spiritual, it's, it's almost like a, a higher octave of that life happens to me. Right? It's at a higher octave, but it's still passive again. How, how in fact can you be present? How can your pattern manifest if you're stepping aside, if you're a spectator, in a way, to what's going on. And so you don't stay at that stage. You go on to the next stage, which is life happens as me. And when you're in that stage of development, that is where you are fully present. The presence of Deirdre or Lisa Mary Lynn is, is fully there. And then you're practicing your presence completely and fully. So think of that story about Picasso again. Okay, sometimes when he was painting, he was Picassoing, and sometimes he wasn't. But what about when he was doing other stuff? Again, I have no idea, but we can sort of ask the question. Ask the question, was he Picassoing when he was cleaning his brushes, buying his paints, doing the laundry, walking the dog, whatever? In the day-to-day -day circumstances of his life, or was, was the talent that he had for painting so great that he just focused on being Picasso during those moments when he was painting? But what about us? When are we being fully present? Remember that, that phrase, practicing the presence of God, goes back to Brother Lawrence. And in his book, The Practice of the Presence of God, he says that he was actually able to more fully practice God's presence 
when he was doing his chores at the monastery in the kitchen with all the clanging and clamor and things going on, than when he was in his cell meditating or praying. And I wonder how much we reserve our spiritual emphasis to those times when we're doing treatment, when we're meditating, and not when we're doing the laundry, doing the dishes, walking the dog. Again, I go back to myself and the chronic fatigue syndrome, and I ask, can I or how can I be present when I'm lying in bed and can't get up or when the, the fatigue syndrome manifests as complete mental fog and I can't think coherently? How do I manifest that pattern of perfection then? And to make that a more general thing for, <laughs> since, since happily uh, you guys don't have chronic fatigue, how do I do it when I have a headache? or toothache, or an anxiety attack, or just when, when things are getting to me? How do I allow or create the, the mental condition or the spiritual condition that allows my pattern of perfection to do what it is seeking to, to manifest? Again, I don't have all the answers here. Uh, I'm asking the questions and inviting each of you to ask the questions, not just here and now, but in your lives. When you, when you do go about doing the dishes, am I practicing my presence? And when something hits and throws you for a loop, am I practicing my presence now? Well, I started this talk with a story about a painter. I'm going to end with a story about a musician. And I'm even more vague about where I got this story from. But I believe it was, I think it was Arthur Rubenstein. And he was being interviewed either just before or just after he was going to do a concert at, at Carnegie Hall. And I guess the interviewer, remembering the old joke, asked him, well, Mr. Rubenstein, you're so accomplished. You're so, I mean, you're such a, a perfect pianist. How do you, do you still practice a lot? And Rubenstein laughed. He said, well, I practice every single day. Uh, if, a, if a day goes by and I don't practice, then the next day I can tell the difference. And if two days go by, it should happen to go by and I don't practice, all the other musicians can tell. And if three days were to go by and I didn't practice, the audience would know. So, how do you get to that place where your pattern is manifesting? Practice. Practice.